I'm going to talk to you today about uh, something I call creative disruptions. And this is stealing a little bit from Clayton Christensen's idea of disruptive technologies. Um, but it's really what happens next. I mean, everybody in this room, I believe, is fabulous at coming up with new technologies and thinking about how to solve problems and innovation. But what I do as a journalist and also, as Phil described, a user of all the cool things you guys are doing, uh, trying to test them out, test drive them, if you will. Uh, what happens next once you come up with these great technologies? And I'm going to start out by asking you a question which I'm sure you did not expect to get. Um, I'm a historian by training. I'm maybe one of the few people who don't have a degree in engineering or science. Um, but that helps me actually be an observer, I think, anyway. Uh, when was the first steam engine invented? Didn't expect to get that one today, did you? Does anybody know? Was it the 1600s? Maybe 1700s? Shh. There's always one who gives it away. Okay, 1700s, maybe 1800s. Actually, the date was 70 AD. And it was uh, not Greece, although there was a Greek who, who actually <coughs> created the first steam engine. His name was Hero, and he lived in Alexandria, Egypt back in the heyday of the Roman Empire when, when uh, Egypt was a uh, Roman province. And this fellow named Hero actually created the first working steam engine. It was a, a hollowed metal ball, halfway filled with water, with counterpost spigots, put on a little line, and they lit a fire under it, and the steam came out of the spigots, and the thing spun around. First steam engine. Now, by legend, he supposedly mentioned to the Roman governor, hey, we should put this on a ship. I think we know the answer, right? I mean, what did the Roman governor say? What are you talking about? We have slaves, we have wind. You know, why would we need this thing? So we have to jump ahead almost 1,700 years to a gentleman named Thomas Newcomb, who in 1722 in Britain actually discovered or rediscovered the steam engine. And in fact, he's holding it there. That's a statue. Um, it was a device that pumped water out of the mines, uh, the coal mines. Now, the, why am I telling this story? The reason is because some cultures know how to handle technologies and some don't. For some, it's a toy. For some, it launches the Industrial Revolution. And the question I want to pose to you before I jump into creative disruptions and talk about the disruption, I'm going to give you just one disruption. Usually, I give two or three. But since we don't have enough time, I'm going to talk about the problem with data and what we do with data. But the question here really is, are we going to be the Romans? Or are we going to be the British and all this cool technology we're doing? And we may think, well, of course, we are going to be the British. We are going to launch a new age. But, you know, think about it. This is where civilizations rise and fall. And it's very, very complicated because when I'm talking about um, creation, um, the disruptions are actually easy, as it turns out, especially out here in our part of the world. Uh, technologies fly like crazy. I mean, you're going to Silicon Valley and you're going to get whacked in the head by one every time you go down. Um, it's the creative use of these that's hard, and especially in health, because we're talking about the complexity of the human body. We're talking about an almost as complex system for how we deliver health care. And it's everything from uh, business to investing to law to medicine to politics. And these are the things that, that fascinate me. It's that space between the discovery and what comes next in all of these kind of sloppy areas. I mean, engineers don't, don't like to talk about politics. You know, there's a reason why they're out here and, and Washington is across the country. Um, you know, you don't like to talk about regulation or, or legal issues. I mean, these things are difficult and you can't, you know, it's not like writing code. It's tough. And then the final question is, <laughs> I don't even understand code, but I do understand this stuff, um, at least probably more than writing code. Um, and then the final really issue is, and these are all things I want you to think about as, as I'm running through the talk here, um, what do users really want? And that's where my experiment, the experimental man, comes in, and somebody like me who writes stories trying to interpret what you guys are doing. It's really the bottom line. Every editor I have says, uh, you know, so what? You know, I tell them about some cool new thing, and I got to really think that I, even to make a living, to, to be able to sell a story. But that's the key thing here. You know, as much as you, you make a beautiful app, or, you know, you love to talk about it with, you know, with your friends out here, it has to be 
it has to hit that threshold of being useful for people. So the disruption we're going to go over here today, heaps of data. It's all the data that's out there. And this is an interesting chart that my friend Eric Shad at Pacific Biosciences, uh, Biosystems loaned me. Biosciences, actually, that's spelled wrong in there. And um, this goes all the way back to the beginning of time. And you can see at least human time. 40,000 BC, there wasn't much, really. Uh, and you move through time, even as recently as 1950, with a computer, uh, the internet, invention of the internet, you know, you're talking about below 10 gigabytes of data that's out there. And then you have this enormous increase just in the last few years. You hit the, the petabyte threshold in 2008, and incredibly now, this is an IBM study that just came out, we are producing 2.5 exabytes of data a day. That's quintillions of data a day. And we have produced 90% of all data created by humanity since the beginning of human history in the last two years. So that's the kind of volume of data. Yeah, and now, most of that probably is not healthcare data, because as we know, most of it sits uh, still in paper. Um, but we're rapidly moving uh, towards digitizing everything. And I think it's worthwhile to stop and think about what these numbers really mean. And just one illustration of this is the number of human genomes that have been sequenced. I've had mine sequenced uh, as part of the Experimental Man Project, but curiously enough, we were down in the, maybe the single digits of genomes just three or four years ago. Uh, last year, there were probably as many as, actually this chart says 10,000, uh, it's probably more like triple that in 2011, in 2011. and it's just going to exponentially grow. Um, I was at the J.P. Morgan meeting a couple weeks ago when a company called Ion Torrent announced uh, they will be having a $1,000 genome by the end of the year. And I would guess that you will have a $100 genome and then a free genome within a few years. And what you'll be buying is the network and the system um, that interprets it for you. And it'll be a little bit like a cell phone where, you know, you don't pay much for the cell phone. You, you buy the Verizon uh, system. So just to give you another... I mean, these giant numbers, lots of zeros uh, going off into infinity almost. Uh, if everybody on the planet had their genome sequenced, you'd be in zettabytes. And I had to you know, begin to look these up as we got up into these really big numbers. That's 10 to the 23rd, so hundreds of zettabytes of data just downloading everybody's genome and the interpretation of that genome on the planet. So that's the kind of issues we're talking about. And when um, you know, I run around doing my stories, talking to all the great people out there doing things. Um, I just think of it in terms of data. So, you know, genetics, uh, proteomics, scanning technologies. Scans have, create a, an enormous amount of data, MRI scans especially. Uh, environmental data, uh, microbial data. I'm about to get my uh, microbiome analyzed uh, in a couple weeks. All the little critters running around in my gut. Um, drug data. Uh, nanotechnology, I could go on and on and on, but you get the idea. This is all creating enormous amounts of data. That's stem cells. Um, and then you have all the biomonitoring devices that uh, we all are kind of playing with and having some fun. Um, you know, everything from monitoring blood sucrose levels to Fitbits to sleep monitors, all creating data. And then all the apps, massive amounts of data. And the question really is, what do we do with this? And I even have my own personal data because of the Experimental Man Project. And I, I'm going to give you a little of interpretation of that project. If you all have, Maybe some of you have seen the talk. I would love for you to read the book. Um, but I'll give you just a, a little glimpse at what that was about in terms of the data produced and also what it meant for me. Was it useful for me? Did we hit that usefulness threshold? So the Experimental Man Project, thousands of tests. Um, I'm actually the 10th anniversary now, believe it or not, uh, of this testing. It was originally a Wired story in 2001 where they asked me to look at this newfangled thing called the Human Genome Project, and I managed to talk somebody into testing me. So thousands of tests, hundreds of labs and companies. Um, I have over 22,000 genotypes or traits identified, uh, genetic, and I will give you a little hint, it has not changed my life uh, yet. Um, hundreds of environmental toxin levels have been tested, uh, brain scans, um, proteomics, microbiomics, the list goes on and on. And you might think at this point, this guy's insane. Why did he take all these tests? And the reason I did it really was as a communicator. 
and I can get more into that if you all want to talk about it afterwards, why exactly I did this. Um, but it was mostly out of frustration in trying to tell the story and, and humanize it and make it make sense. So you can get a lot more information on this on the Experimental Man Project website, experimentalman.com. And there's the book if you want to grab a copy of that. It is uh, electronic as well, ebook. Um, so what does a person do with over 500 gigabytes of data? Um, I mean, this is quite extraordinary. And remember I gave that number about uh, the, the, the amount of data that would be generated if uh, everyone had their genome sequence. So I've gone way beyond that, obviously. I have a lot more data than that. And at that point, uh, you would be in Yoda bytes. And I almost put a picture of Yoda up here, but I thought that would be sort of stupid. But, uh, you know, the force be with us, I guess, on, you know, what the heck we do with that. And I, you know, I, I guess I've got to go, you know, to a different source to even find out what we call numbers after that, 10 to the 24th. Um, extraordinarily high numbers. Um, you start getting into numbers of like the entire human brain at the quantum level is, is I think, 10 to the 45th power. Um, you know, a black hole is 10 to the 75th. So that's where we're headed. Um, anyway, to give you a little brief glimpse into what I found out. So I've given you the data here. That's, that was what was produced uh, in a very short form. So what was the interpretation of some of this information? And again, there's a whole talk and a whole book about this, and I can just give you a, a few highlights here. I found out I have a slightly elevated risk of heart attack. Now, 20% risk sounds a little scary, but it's really not. It's just 20% higher than the average. Uh, if it was two or three times risk, that might be more interesting. Um, but I will give you a hint that I have over 300 markers associated with heart attack, and actually they're all over the map. Some give me a higher risk, some give me a lower risk. So that gives you some idea of why we need to have some more work done on interpreting this data. Um, I was tested for the empathy gene. Do I have empathy or not? And I don't, so I don't really give a crap what you think. Alzheimer's, uh, no trace, and, and by the way, in, in defense of me, I actually think I am pretty empathetic, but uh, there are other genes that suggest that I might be more empathetic, but this is the issue with genetics. You can kind of make any, anything of it you want right now because much of it is so preliminary and hasn't been thoroughly tested. Um, now, Alzheimer's, uh, this is an MRI scan. You can trace uh, Alzheimer's in a person's future now. It's a very expensive test. It's actually being used as a diagnostic. Um, I had no trace, thankfully, but uh, you can actually tr you know, predict now before someone starts showing symptoms. And when you combine it with some, some fairly good genetic tests, uh, you're beginning to see where this could be going. Um, in the MRI scanner, I was tested for behavioral traits like, say, greed and altruism. I came out normal in greed. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Normally greedy or... Um, Proteomics, I had some blood chemistry done on some very cool tests um, and came out normal, thankfully. Uh, we all have um, uh, small proteins uh, that are cancerous but never go anywhere in our bloodstream. And there's some beginning to be some interesting work done on being able to track one's progress with cancer and, and with different therapies through proteomics, through proteins in, in the blood and other tissue. Um, and then uh, finally, environmental testing. Uh, Again, hundreds of levels, and these are not probabilities, these are actually levels compared to Centers for Disease Control data, which is kept. And just one example is DDT, which is the famous uh, pesticide that was banned back in the 70s. And I have a fairly high level of that compared to most Americans because I actually grew up in eastern Kansas where they were still spraying the stuff when I was a little kid. So all these years later, it shows up. So my favorite genetic marker, however, and those of you who have a cup of coffee, you may raise it, is the caffeine fast metabolizer gene. I'm gonna take a little sip here. <laughs> My body did not metabolize that. And I can drink coffee right before I go to bed. How many people can drink coffee right before they go to bed? Okay, that's about, it, it's always about, it's about 25% of the population. That, that's about what it should be genetically. And all you poor people have to stop drinking coffee at 3 p.m. who love coffee, I, I feel bad for you, but tough luck. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive into one aspect of the Experimental Man Project to, to show what, um, you know, in my own small way, uh, I've been trying to do to try to make sense of some of my data. So there's a toxic chemical, mercury, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, a heavy metal, and it um, comes mostly from burning coal, and this is the coal that comes out of the ground, it's in, the, in there. 
Uh, you burn it in power plants. Um, we have them all over the industrialized world and elsewhere. Um, this is actually how it gets in, inside of us, the, the beginning of the story. Uh, this is a NASA satellite from China, and China's building a, a new coal burning power plant, actually at the rate of greater than one a week now. And th you can see the, the cloud there is not weather, that's actually effluence, that's pollution going across. And in that cloud is mercury, mercury's invisible, so you're you don't see it. But guess where it's dumping? Guess where it's headed? Right off our coast. And what happens is the mercury gets into the food chain by being absorbed by plankton. Small fish eat the plankton, bigger fish eat the smaller fish, and it moves right on up that food chain, and then you get it in these big fish. And this is a halibut. And what I did for the Experimental Man project, uh, and by the way, halibut's probably about a medium fish. It's actually not very, real high on the food chain. Something like certainly a shark, a uh, swordfish, very large tuna, small tuna are okay. And the FDA, before I start scaring you, uh, the FDA does recommend that we eat fish, uh, but maybe not the big ones that, that have the accumulated mercury. So what I did for this part of the experimental man was I went out and um, I caught a fish. Um, this is a halibut. This is actually not the one I caught, though. Mine was much smaller. Um, and I had a swordfish. Um, and I had the halibut for lunch and the swordfish for dinner. And I did a before and after mercury level test. And so again, this is trying to find meaning in, in data, okay? So four parts per billion was my before level, and that's below the safety threshold of the EPA, which is 5.8 parts per billion. Afterward, 13 parts per billion, these two meals. So it was a pretty dramatic increase. But I didn't stop there. I also went into a field that we're calling envirogenomics, which is one's uh, genetic sensitivity to different environmental toxins and environmental effects. And there I had an interesting result. I mostly came out okay in genes that are associated with sensitivity to mercury, except for this one called BDNF, which I actually uh, gives me some high risk for cognition, mood disorders, motor functions. So between the empathy and the mood you know, stuff, uh, just leave me alone, okay? <laughs> um, now to take this a step further, we actually have started a company, and a couple of people here are involved with it. Uh, we're still, shh, still stealth. Um, it's called e Ecoios, and the first product is MyMercury, and we were hoping to actually have a few samples of these for the meeting today, but we, if you come to some of these meetings in the next couple months, uh, this is a spit test. You send it in, and we give you back a pretty cool response. It's based on a $14 million NIH study on mercury sensitivity. So some of the challenges here uh, to making this, our little company and others work, uh, the data has to be validated and standardized. As I mentioned earlier, this stuff is not fun. Um, the FDA, to file or not to file, it's still very unclear what's going on there. Uh, health versus medicine, the whole idea of predictive, staying healthy, preventive, and, and personalized medicine, which is being treated when you're sick. And then for investors, uh, and I'd love, I would have loved to hear more from the panel on this, some of you may find yourself sort of squeezed between people who know the IT world and who know the life science world, and they don't really get where the two connect as well. And we're getting some people who are, are learning more about that. Anyway, more experiments, uh, proteomics, uh, this is a pictogram linking different things, stem cells, this actually are my heart cells in a petri dish that were made by creating stem cells. Um, this little figure here also from Eric Schatt gives you an idea of, of where more data will be coming from. I mean, that's, that's the human body right there, basically all the different things we can measure. And what's needed? We really need a revolution in interpretive tools. And I'm hammering away on that, but uh, for people like me to really reach that, that useful threshold, um, so all of you that are designing ways to collect data, also think about how to interpret it. Uh, entrepreneurs are obviously key. The government's not going to do this. You know, the, in fact, even academia doesn't know what to do really about this. A new, new ecosystems need to be made to you know, open source sort of ecosystems to create standards. Uh, and it's beginning to happen. I mean, we have a lot of people here, and you go to these meetings. Uh, it's beginning to be certainly discussed and talked about. There's Rock Health. So I'll leave you with, do you want to be the Romans or the British? Thank you.